So, very topical, um, and uh, as Oisin Smith and Catherine Sheridan, Mr Oisin Smith and Catherine Sheridan have already pointed out, uh, where is Ireland going to get its energy independence from to avoid situations that we're in now and situations that we had in the 70s, situations that we had in the 80s and the 90s, the Gulf War, with uh, energy crises? And the solution is, is the offshore wind opportunity that, that, that's here in Ireland. Um, joined by uh, fantastic panellists, two offshore developers who, who told me they're not going to fight with each other over... Uh, locations in the coast, but, and then John Salazar from uh, Gazelle, um, who will tell us a little bit about it, their story, and our very own Deirdre Nagel from Mason Hayes and Kern, um, head of our planning and environmental team. Um, before we get into sort of the general discussion, um, the week leading into the conference, we asked all of the attendees to complete a pre-conference survey. Slightly unusual to ask people to complete a survey beforehand. And, and I'm t I was told to kind of keep the results under wraps until after the conference, but I'm going to break that rule. Um, and I want to actually focus in on two of the questions that are obviously relevant to, to our panel and get the views from the panelists now, as we have everyone here, um, as what they think about, about the results. So um, the first sort of offshore question we asked is, what do, the, what do you think is currently the greatest challenge to offshore wind delivery in Ireland? And we asked everyone here to rank those in order of priority uh, for where one is the most serious challenge and seven is the least serious challenge. Okay? And there's probably more than seven challenges, but we think we, we captured the, the, the ones that were most, most important. And the results, the results actually aren't that surprising, but there's a little bit more behind them, I think, that would be worth digging into. So planning risk came out just a little fraction ahead of grid infrastructure. Um, then came regulatory uncertainty, then supply chain issues, then staffing and, res and resourcing, then securing finance, and then, then uncertainty as to level of compensation. Um, now, I wouldn't mind actually turning to you uh, first, Barry, to, to give your view on this. Like, are, you know, are people underestimating the difficulties of other aspects and challenges purely because planning and grid are the ones that we're facing right now? I, d I think to some extent they are. Um, oh, and I think the answer to that question is all about uncertainty and removing uncertainty in the environment. Um, so the first phase of projects, phase one, uh, hopefully they're going into a, an auction middle of next year, but they're carrying with them a huge amount of uncertainty. Not only are they carrying planning risk into that auction, but they're also carrying uncertainty around firm access, around air grid zone M policy, um, you know, and around things, you know, fun, fundamental financial aspects like indexation and how indexation is going to be treated. And all of that sums up to um, a very challenging landscape for shareholders and for investors. And I think that's one of the things that we may go into a little bit more yeah. detail later, but that, that's one of the things that I think we need to address as an industry. The known unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld might say. The known say. unknowns, yeah. you know, because we, we can, we have the power to be able to deal with some of them. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to deal with the unknown unknowns, but let's, let's try and address the challenges that we can. And, and Catherine, would you, would you agree with, um, oh, sorry, Vanessa, would you agree with the, um, would you agree with, with, with that view around planning and grid? Is that, you know, as, as a developer, is that what you're seeing? Yeah, that, that is top of the list for sure, but I think it comes back, I think it's, it's on the list, it's, it's actually the implementation and delivery. So I think we're seeing really good signals in terms of the policy and on, on the grid. And I think it goes back to sort of the certainty point as well, but it is that delivery point is, um, you know, where, where are the resources to actually deliver on this? You know, we haven't delivered offshore wind since the original Arco Bank project. So I think that we need to give confidence to the market, um, yeah, to, to the international market as well, that we actually can deliver. So it was actually comforting to hear Rushing saying today from an onboard Planola perspective that resourcing will not be an issue. I think now it's like, it'll be great to see it. And then I'll also say back to, you know, Catherine's point, it is then about working together to deliver. So I think for me, that's probably where I sit coming from the offshore wind industry in the UK, where I was working there for the last 10 years. So lots of projects being delivered. That's where I sit nervous. It's like, can we deliver and how can we actually give that confidence that we are going to, we are, we are going to be able to do that? And, and John, as not quite as an outsider looking looking in, but like you know, you're not in the in the weeds and detail on grid and planning. What do you see as the, the biggest challenge in Ireland? On oh, my thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Um, if we want to tap into the power, the available wind resource in the south and the west, then we need to go floating. We need to tap into floating wind. And for that, we need to go beyond 60 meters in depth from the surface level of the sea uh, to the bottom. And uh, as of today, uh, in no way, shape, matter, or form, I see a local supply chain ready for doing that. Bear in mind that um, the trend is for wind turbines to be as tall as skyscrapers. We are going for wind turbines that are 285 meters, 50 megawatt, 60 megawatt, and we need to keep this stable and we need to keep this floating. So where are we going to manufacture this floating substructure that are massive? Where are we going to do the assemble? Who's going to provide all the service operation vessels? Uh, who's going to uh, give the o &M necessary for tackling this? So there are massive opportunities as well uh, from a supply chain point of view. And for sure, I agree that policy is key to foster the investment and, and catch up with that supply chain. And, and Deirdre, when you're you know, being approached by clients, you know, that, that uncertainty, is, you know, is that... Is that causing concern. It's very hard as a, as a lawyer to advise in an uncertain environment, but... It is, it is. All, um, I think uh, a lot of the issues are stuff that I suppose, from an industry perspective, you think is just eminently practical to be done. For example, turbine technology moves on. If we, if we can build, say, five megawatts today, will we be allowed, in, by the time we build this out, be able to build seven megawatts and things like that? So... I suppose a lot of it is maybe the legal system responding to those issues and there's necessarily a time lag as a result. But I think a lot of those issues are being understood now by government and relevant departments and you'll see them now starting to feed their way through to legislation. And tackle them. And then, So then I, I wouldn't mind actually just the second question we asked everyone and I'm going to get a really quick response from you guys on this is whether you agree or disagree with the balance of opinion in the room. So you're a very pessimistic group out there. Um, so we know that the, the target by, for 2030 has been increased from five gigawatts to seven gigawatts of offshore wind. And we asked you, you know, how do you view this challenge? Do you view it as realistic and achievable? Do you view it as challenging but achievable? Do you view it as extremely challenging but potentially achievable or completely unrealistic? And um, 30, almost 30% of you view it as completely unrealistic. Uh, over 40% view it as extremely challenging. So you've got 70, over 70% in the room, you know, really don't think we're going to get there on this very vital uh, target. So would you, I mean, yes or no, are you, are you in that 70%? Look, I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer, but what I will... <laughs> That's what, what I, I asked for, Mary. <laughs> what I will say is, look, we, we welcome the 7 gigawatt, the increase of 7 gigawatt, uh, something that SSE Renewables were calling for. We also welcome the 2 gigawatt of hydrogen, um, and we hope that that's linked to an emerging realisation, back to Catherine's point, that in the 2030s, the Irish grid is going to be saturated. It will not be able to take any more power. So we need to look for an alternate mechanism to transport that energy. Back to your point, Owen, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Do you know, uh, we're hoping to have an auction for the first phase of projects middle of next year. There's a huge amount of uncertainty associated with that. Uh, we're hoping to allocate seabed for uh, phase two projects next year as well. There's a lot of work to be done there. And rolling on to the phase one projects, it's unlikely that they will be submitting a planning application until the end of next year at the latest or at the earliest. When are they going to secure planning? And, you know, you can do the sums yourself in terms of it takes about four odd years to deliver one of these projects once you, once you reach financial close. So 2030 is going to be really challenging. Vanessa? Yeah, I'll agree with everything that's been said, but I think for me, I think we get a little bit focused on the targets. You know, it's a number. It's a nice, well, actually, it's not a nice round number anymore. It's gone from five to seven, so, so maybe we're moving away from that, but, and 2030. So I think it is obviously important to have targets and have a, a sort of direction of travel and be moving towards that. And I think increasing the target just increases that level of ambition. So everyone in this room today is now maybe more energised to say, it's not five, okay, now we've got to get to seven. But whether we reach the target or not, I think the really important thing is that we have really got moving. We've got a number of projects that are commissioned in construction and we're moving towards that net zero target because ultimately that's the goal. So I think I, I'm not going to say whether we're going to make it or not. I don't think anyone knows if we're going to make it or not. I think we all have a view right now sitting here today, you know, where we are now. But we know the huge challenge that's in front of us and that we all need to move. And I think I'm incredibly optimistic. I'm going to stay optimistic. That's who I am. We all need to be optimistic because we have no choice. We have to get to net zero. So whether we make the 2030 or not, I think it's maybe 
something we just shouldn't focus on too much because I don't think that will be a measure of whether we've succeeded or not. I think the question, Owen, you, you may have wanted to ask is, can, back to the point that you made, can we afford not to make this 7 gigawatt target? And I don't think we can. You know, we've had our, our homework marked there, uh, was it this week? We got a C down from a C, C plus last year. Um, and, you know, there seems to be a misalignment between climate ambition and climate action. We need to fix that. Well, I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I dream big, I think big, of course. Um, now, um, it's a matter of mindset, it's a matter of, we, we cannot continue playing not to lose. To achieve these type of targets, we need to play to win. There is a big difference in, in playing not to lose or playing to win. So, uh, that's, that's necessary, it's necessary a sense of urgency. There are challenges, as we alluded before, from a policy point of view, to have that certainty. But there are huge also uh, challenges from a technical point of view and supply chain point of view. So this is, this is a, a wake-up call for all the business owners on the audience, all the influential people. That, that war mindset is necessary in order to achieve that type of goals in such a short time. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think you know, Philip hit the nail on the head when he just talked about the international competitive environment that that, that we're being faced with here, and um, you know, and we're and we're competing with more mature offshore markets with better structured supply chains, heavy industry, port infrastructure than we have. So, like, like Barry, I think just you know, to make Ireland a more attractive location um, for delivering offshore wind in the short term, um, it, you know, is the answer trying to make offshore wind in Ireland more affordable than it is elsewhere? And, and if so, how do we go about doing that? Th th there's, a, there's a couple of measures that we can take. So, you know, if you look around the room today, there's certain entities that are absent, um, you know, from the, from the supply chain. Um, that kind of goes back to the structure of the upcoming auction. So, you know, in other jurisdictions, you could put a bid in, and within six to nine months, you can achieve financial close, have contracts signed, and be steaming on to deliver your projects. Because of the structure of the auction that we're setting up here in Ireland, it'll be two plus years before, at, at a minimum, before contracts are signed post uh, developers, you know, confirming that they're successful in res. And, and that makes us very unattractive for the, for the international market. You know, um, similarly, at the scale of the projects that we have, you know, the 800 megawatts of this world, is now coming to the point where they're small in an international context. So if you, if you layer all those risks upon each, upon each other and you have the supply chain look from the outside in, you know, they can focus um, their efforts on other jurisdictions where you know, there is an established route to market, there is 15 plus years of delivery experience, and they have a higher likelihood of success. So I, I, I think there is an opportunity now for us to structure the auction so that we're actually making it more attractive to the supply chain rather than less attractive, which, which is what we're doing at the moment. So capital follows the path of least resistance. It does. It yeah. does. And, and uh, Vanessa, just looking at, say, your experience between, you know, what, what you experience in the UK, you know, which is the most advanced offshore market in the world, um, and comparing that to what we have in Ireland, you know, wh where do you see the supply chain deficits here and, like, what really needs to be prioritised by, by government yeah, I think, I think for me there's two elements when we, when we think about the supply chain. There is the international supply chain, which we've heard about from, from Barry and, and also Philip. I think we were listening to the, the same webinar this week. Is about, um, and Ireland's going to be reliant on that. We're not going to have, well, we may in, in time, but we're not in the short term going to have turbo manufacturers here. We're not going to have foundation uh, manufacturers here. So we need the supply chain to come, and that includes the, um, the, the, the vessels, the T&I contractors. So I think there's the international supply chain and then being attracted to the Irish market. And then there's Ireland build, build, building their own local indigenous supply chain. And that's important for a number of reasons. It's important to support the overall delivery of the offshore wind farm. It's helping build resilience into delivery of offshore wind in Ireland. And I think what's a really key point is actually um, you know, creating an industry here an industry that people are excited about and want to support, and it's giving jobs to you know, th their children and their children's children. I think that is a fundamental point in terms of the overall sort of long-term support for offshore wind and, and the, these huge infrastructure projects being built uh, in, in our country, off our shores. So I think challenges for sure in terms of the international supply chain. I think there's 
targets for 160 gigawatts across Europe right now, up from, by 2030, up from 28 gigawatts today. So that's a six-fold increase from where we are today. Where is Ireland within that? We've obviously got our target, but again, you know, are they attracted to come here? And I think the, the solve to that is around the certainty. So I also took away that point, Jan Donald saying, saying to developers, if you want us to build a project for you by 2030, I'll say what Philip said again, you need to be making, entering to, into a contract next year. So for phase one projects, yeah, we've got, they've got a level of certainty. For the phase two projects, which are required to meet the 2030 goals, we don't yet have a timeline about when we're going to get site exclusivity. So for, for a developer to be able to enter into a contract, you need to know that you've got the lands to be able to build that. So that's, that's really critical. And then I think from a local indigenous perspective, you know, we don't currently have um, a construction base here in Ireland. So if we look to other markets such as Scotland and the UK, you know, frankly, they have struggled to build a local supply chain. I think with the last look in, in Scotland, I think they had a 20% supply chain. But I think what you're seeing in the UK and other markets is, is the coming together and having a plan. So in the UK, they've got this target for 60% local content. And I'm not saying that's what we should have in Ireland, but I do think that we need to come together and have a plan. You know, we need to sit down together as developer, as government, and say, okay, what do we want and how are we going to get there? And that goes back to, to Catherine's point. To, you know, she's a woman after my own heart. I want to bang this drum again and again and again. It's not about government. It's not about industry. It's, and it's not about the communities all you know, dis disparate. We actually really do need to sit together, be building trust with each other over time, and then I think that's how we, we can succeed. And I think, so, so just kind of to sum up sort of two points, in terms of the international supply chain and, and getting them to come to Ireland, it's around certainty. So that's, you know, the O-Res auctions, it's having the policy targets, but it's also back to my original point, actually giving evidence that we are going to deliver. And then from a local perspective, I think it's about, um, yeah, it's about having a plan and focusing on our niches. So if we're saying, you know, we want to have a turbine manufacturer in Ireland, is that realistic? Is that actually what we want in Ireland? What do we want from a local supply chain? Should, let's focus on our niches. We've had a real great success in terms of um, attracting sort of the digital economy into Ireland. Is that where we want to play from an offshore wind perspective? Using the, the, you know, the advantages that we already have in that space to both serve the, the Irish market and international. And I think, John, it might, that might be a good intro for you actually to give a little bit of a background to Gazelle, because a lot of people in the room may, may not be aware of who you are and what you've done over the last few years. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Ian. So at, at Gazelle, we are introducing the next generation of floating offshore wind substructures. As I was alluding before, uh, we want to tap into the power of uh, floating offshore wind in the south and the west. We need to put um, wind turbines that can be as tall as the Eiffel Tower, over 200 meters in height, and we need to keep this uh, floating and, and stable. And uh, for that, it's very important uh, to use this type, this type of floating substructures. But to give uh, a bit of further context about what we're doing, and the, the reality, as Philip was saying before, is we are at a crucial point in humankind where we are transitioning from a fossil fuel reality to a decarbonized world. And this cannot be, as Vanessa was saying before, this cannot be simply for achieving uh, targets from a government or a particular corporation. This is a matter of survival. And this survival goes through the generation of renewable energy and the storage of that, of that renewable energy. If we look at offshore wind, the opportunity is massive globally. DMB is targeting, is forecasting 2 terawatt, 2,000 gigawatt in the next three decades. That's a multi-trillion euro market opportunity. If you only look at floating offshore wind, DMB is forecasting over 264 gigawatt. That's a total addressable market of over 500 billion euros. So uh, it's very important for Ireland and for the local supply chain to not sit, not sit on the coach, not wait for that to happen. We need to go out, we need to get that expertise, we need to be um, on top of the main markets that, that are now uh, being developed, so then we can come back and we can de develop all these, all these projects. And that's exactly what we're doing at Gazelle. Um, the leading floating technologies will not be simply those floating substructures designed to float and survive. Everyone is assuming that that's going to float and survive over there, even in very rough seas. The winners will be those solutions that, are, that make sense from a CapEx perspective, we are, we are solving, we need to solve levelized cost of electricity. And if, if we summarize part of the discussion, we can identify, we, we've already said, there is a policy challenge. We need the right mechanisms in order for this industry to really start, start taking up. We can learn from onshore wind, 
Onshore wind is a successful story in Europe, but it's also a painful one. It took a while for onshore wind to get to the levels where we are today. We cannot make the same mistake with, with offshore and with floating. So we should learn from that, put the right mechanisms, uh, put in place that supply chain. So that certainty, again, is very, very important. And uh, I believe you, you put uh, great examples about what is needed and, and getting focus on those niches. And of course, hand in hand goes the technologies. And that's why we are, we are seeking to solve. Uh, proud to be uh, headquartered here in Dublin. Uh, and to, to end, I, I recall the first time I was here in Dublin was when I was seven years old. I was with a lovely Irish family uh, learning English in Bray. And I recall that that's where I learned to, to play rugby and to, and to fight and to, and to learn English. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I recall looking at, at those Irish kids, I thought, whoa, these, these, these kids are fierce. My God, they are, they, are, they are not playing not to lose, they're playing to win. That's the same attitude we need to all together in this room have in order to achieve this type of, of goals, the carbonization goals. Otherwise, it will be a missed opportunity. And, and let's not delude ourselves with this type of targets because we've already lost the opportunity. For instance, from an R&D point of view, uh, there is, I was in Stavanger last week. And, and, and you, can see, you can see floating technologies already uh, piloting there with all the investment and exposure that that's attracting. Majors from oil and gas, renewable energy, renewable energy majors, why, why that's not happening here in Ireland? Why I need to take my, my pilot project to the Atlantic Ocean onto another place and I cannot deploy in Ireland? So we should ask ourselves these questions. So there is, there is an opportunity for Ireland to be an R&D hub if we make the right decisions and invest and put policy in place in the right way? No, absolutely. For us, uh, this is a very friendly business environment. We've got a, a modicum of success. We were, Gazelle was uh, a success story from the European Commission uh, as we are moving very, very fast. We are one of the fastest moving companies in this, in this specific niche. Um, now, I I innovation will play a huge role. And uh, when you are starting, these type of initiatives are quite capex intensive. For sure, we need software to optimize the grid, but without hardware solutions, deep tech solutions that power and balance the grid, there is, there is no energy transition. You cannot, you cannot enable floating offshore wind if you don't have the right hardware. And that initially is very capex intensive and you need to move very, very quickly. So the role of, of the uh, SMEs in this room, the, the role of the startups is absolutely key because we can move forward very quickly, we can push that innovation and uh, surely uh, that R&D um, or, or that capital to increase the techno technology readiness level uh, to a commercial stage is absolutely key. And that's something that, um, if, again, if we don't have that war mindset, I was alluding before, uh, Ireland will, will miss the opportunity. The, the world is moving very quickly. And um, again, the, there are already countries uh, far, far ahead to deploying these technologies. Um, talking of a war mindset, um, the, one of the warriors in this group is, is, is Deirdre Nagel, who's been battling the um, <laughs> planning objectors and the courts for a number of years on all kinds of various aspects of onshore wind and, and on offshore sure challenges. But, Deirdre, a lot of people obviously see consenting as being the major, major risk for their projects. And you know, what can be done in terms of reform in the short and medium term? Sure. Well, the first thing to say is that there is reform taking place. So everyone's aware of the long and, and difficult birth of the Maritime Area Planning Act, but that has been enacted now. And it set up a, 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 a huge uh, a change in Irish legislation in, in terms of having a consenting system in the maritime area. The government also is, uh, as you're aware, carrying out the reforms of the planning legislation, and that's currently taking place. And some of those reforms have actually already started. So I don't need to explain to anyone in this room uh, when I mention the Jerry Ad litigation and the uncertainty that created around design flexibility. So in July, this, there was an amendment uh, to the Planning Act introduced, which essentially allows um, developers to have discussions with planning authorities and the board to get their opinion on the level of flexibility that, that can be introduced in an application. And that will apply to um, offshore applications. And one of the reasons that you specifically can give for design envelopes is to allow you to avail of innovations and technology. So I think that's, that's important. That's also something I think that is recognised at an EU level, so you'll all be aware of the Repower EU. And in terms of, I suppose, for renewable energy projects and grid connections, one of the things they've said as well is that the consent systems must allow developers to be able to benefit from innovations in technology post-permit granting. 
Um, so like that's, that will also uh, have to f feature in. And another thing which I, I'm sure will be very welcome to everyone here is to provide for maximum timelines. So, I mean, like as, as Barry and, and, and Kat, uh, Vanessa have said, in terms of like reducing the kind of uncertainty, at least if you can, like if someone comes to me now and says, well, when, like how long will this take? And I'll be like, well, it says 18 weeks, but that's a notional target. And the reality is it's, it's, it's 18 months to two years. Whereas now there's going to be a commitment to like, have these uh, consenting processes condensed, essentially, with maximum limits. So at least you can have some certainty for your projects in that regard. Yeah, I mean, certainty in programme is so key. Sorry. Well, no, I, and I, I think that's a really important point because I think it's important, for, particularly from a planning perspective, from an offshore wind pro, uh, pres, um, perspective, is 18 weeks. It, feel, it feels far too short. Mm -hmm. In the UK, it's, it's, eight, it's 18 months mm. for the DCO process, and they're now trying to reduce that to 12 months. So I think for me, that would be really welcome. It's about certainty. It's not trying to squeeze it all into 18 weeks, which is, you know, these significant infrastructure projects. It's just being realistic. So having a year, 18 months, at least we'd have certainty. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things in terms of like, when we're like, um, working through with developers about how to kind of de-risk their projects. I suppose one of the things that can be done, and, and I, I understand the government tends to do, is to try and increase the quality of decision making. Mm -hmm. Like it's fanciful to say like a project will be consented like, of that nature in 18 weeks. And you, you clearly don't, that's adverse to your interest if they try to do that because they'll fly around the racetrack but knock every single hurdle on the way around. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, that's one of the things I think that uh, just needs to be factored in. Anything that we can do, because as much as it may be unpopular for me to say it in this room, judicial reviews are going to happen. There's, there's really no way out of them, I'm afraid. People are entitled to participate mm -hmm. in decision making. But what I suppose we can do is to make sure that the quality of decision making stands up to scrutiny. And also that um, I suppose the courts have, uh, you, know, you know, more kind of things that they can do if they do find a flaw in decision making, as opposed to just straight quash your back to the drawing board. And there is like going to be an increased focus um, on remittal of applications and entitlement for applicants to apply for remittal uh, in front of the courts. So it, essentially what will happen is, as opposed to it being quashed, the decision will uh, basically go back to the board again for basically reconsideration in an effort to fix whatever flaw may have been identified. And like I think that kind of process like allowing the courts to adopt a bit more of a tailored approach will be very beneficial. Yeah. In, sorry, sorry go ahead. just to come in on there, that's an example of kind of low hanging fruit that we within the industry's control, we, we can leverage. You know, other things like, for example, private wires legislation or private pipes legislation when we're thinking forward to hydrogen, they're, they're low hanging things that we can, we can address now. So for example, if private wires legislation, which the industry has been looking for for years now at this stage, was in place, it could have allowed developers to collaborate with large loads, take them off the grid, reduce the overall cost of supply, and reduce the data center challenges that we have now. Other things, for example, like looking forward to 2050 and thinking that it takes 10 plus years to deliver these offshore wind farms. So if we do want our 30 gigawatts by 2050, we need to think about allocating 20 gigawatts of max in the 2020s, 20 gigawatts of max in the 2030s, and 20 gigawatts of max in the 2040s, because we're going to have attrition. And these things are within our control, and, and that will all bring about a level of certainty and comfort to the shareholders and the investors, which will increase the investment flowing into Ireland, which will encourage the likes of upgrades of small ports and maybe, maybe not the turbine and the, you know, the large manufacturing facilities of this world, but smaller manufacturing facilities that allow us to tap into the Dungarvans of this world, uh, the Ross of Eels, you know, to set ourselves up for the floating offshore wind, you know, opportunity that is sitting on our doorstep. So I, I think it's focusing on, you know, those low-hanging fruit, and back to the point Catherine made, collaborating together and trying to identify what we as an industry can do to accelerate development and delivery. And it, as the Minister mentioned, there's the, um, the Offshore Wind Delivery Task Force, which the terms of reference have been issued. You know, like, do you see that as being... The, you know, creating that potential for collaboration and connected reform and joined up reform of all of the issues that need to be addressed. 
Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm actually really excited about this yeah. because when, since I moved back from, from the UK last year, I have been banging a little drum around this idea of a sector deal, you know, in, in Ireland. And I think this is actually the beginning of, of that. It's starting within government. They came together, the cross-departmental group, and they are working hard. We haven't seen any announcements yet of, of deliveries, but from some of the conversations I've been having, they are working hard to sort of join the dots. And supply chain is a key element of that. Ports, it's planning. Um, I think biodiversity needs to be in there. We need, when we're building renewable energy projects, we need to be protecting, potentially enhancing the environment. So that, that is all in there. And what I'm hearing is, uh, and yet to be delivered, but I'm excited, and if there's anyone from government here today, obviously Ushing is here, love to hear more, they will be getting the industry involved. There will be subgroups. And there'll be subgroups for particular topics. And I think that's going to be really important because that goes back to my earlier point of sitting around the table and sharing knowledge and expertise and building a plan and not just putting that plan, you know, on paper, making a flashy announcement, actually then continuing to work together week by week, month by month, and actually have sort of accountability that doesn't just sit on the developer side doesn't sit on the government side, it also should be bringing in relevant sort of environmental stakeholders and community, but that we're all working on it together and that's, there's that collective responsibility. So yes, to your answer, it, it, I think we need to probably move pretty quickly because we, you know, again, it's back to this an emergency, but I'm, um, I'm optimistic of, of what I'm seeing and, and what the potential it's got for, for actually delivering on what we need to do. It's, it's always amazed me as a feature of the energy industry and just working with, with Wind Energy Ireland, like seeing, uh, private developers and interested parties working together and sharing information and yeah. collaborating. I, I don't think you get it in many other industries to the same degree you get it in the energy industry. I think it's quite unique. And it's something that I think that, yeah, the, the department and government should be, should be grasping that opportunity to, um, to, to, to bring that forward and, and leverage off you know, the assistance support that's, that's being thrown out there by, um, by, by industry in, in the area. Well, I think the real success in the UK, and you, you've seen it, Vanessa, was the, the collaboration with key players who could make commitments on behalf of yeah. developers in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So the Offshore Wind Industry Council and the sector deal. Yeah. And that really gave the, the impetus, and, and things happened on the back of that. So, you know, it's absolutely fabulous to see the, the, the government task force coming together, but it's critical that they involve the key players in the industry who are in a position to make commitments yeah. that can be delivered upon. Um, and I think that's what brought about the real success of the UK offshore wind industry. Yeah. And I, and I think just to add, like, yeah, we are sitting, we are competitors, but we're also collaborators. And I think that's what's um, a great example of the likes of Wind Energy Ireland and these other trade associations is there is that recognition that, you know, you're out there playing to win, fighting against each other in this sort of rugby um, analogy, but then you're also then also, you know, you know where you guys need to work together. And ultimately, we only succeed if we, you know, work together. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to say thank you to Deirdre, John, Vanessa, and Barry. Um, hope you found that interesting.